Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's DM at Extra event called Copyright Collectives Are Dead, Long May They Reign. My name is Catherine Moore. I'm a faculty member at the University of Toronto's Faculty of Music, where I teach in the music technology and digital media program. As we gather together using connected technologies, we begin with a land acknowledgement that recognizes our use of those technologies. We acknowledge both our virtual presence and our use of digital resources drawn from session 274 territory. These lands are part of the traditional territories of the Ohlone. These territories extend from the coast of San Francisco through Monterey Bay to Lower Salinas Valley. Please take a moment to recognize the land on which you sit and be aware of the peoples who are the caretakers of that land. Today, September the 30th, 2022, is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation and Orange Shirt Day. The day honors the children who never returned home and the survivors of residential schools, as well as their families and their communities. Let us pause together for a period of silent reflection. In the spirit of and the path towards reconciliation, may this day remind us to take time every day to remember, to respect, to learn, and to support. Regarding ways to support Indigenous creators in the arts, I recently learned about a streaming platform for discovering and listening to music by Indigenous artists. The platform is called Nikawamin, and I will put a link into the chat. Once again, thank you all for joining us today. We invite you to get in touch with us to suggest courses you are part of that would be a good fit to DM at Extra. Our first In the Weeds event in March 2022 took place online in a course at York University, and today we are in a course at the University of Toronto. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Jessica Bay. Jessica Bay is a PhD candidate in communication and culture at York and Toronto Metropolitan Universities. She has completed MAs on blockbuster film sequels and connecting fan fiction to the genre of urban fantasy. Her current research examines the use of fan practices in marketing campaigns for the screen industries. Jessica is co-editor with Mary Grace Lau for the forthcoming book, called Diverging the Popular, Gender, and Trauma, aka the Jessica Jones Anthology. Jessica Bay has taken on a leadership role in all our previous DM and Extra events, most recently in March of this year for an event called Defining a Canadian Program for the Digital Age, and in October 2021 for an event called Don't Be Afraid of the Big Bad Code, Algorithms, AI, and What Lies Ahead. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so welcome to everybody. Uh, it's lovely to have you all here. Um, so I, um, I want to say, first of all, that I'm physically situated in Mi'kma'ki, which is the um, ancestral home and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, and uh, very happy to be here and with power. <laughs> um, and so uh, this event is um, being put on by DM at Extra, which is um, the student group, the organization of students that grew out of um, a desire to make connections and have a space to gather and discuss media policy and industry, uh, both academically and practically. Um, this group uh, came from, uh, is sponsored by and loosely associated with 
the di digital media at the crossroads um, annual conference. So I'm going to put first our, our, this is our Discord link if you'd like to join us on Discord at any time. But also you can find the, um, you can find DM at X uh, and DM at Extra. We've got some, some links to some, some of the stuff that we've done previously on the DM at X website. Um, and the next conference is coming up. The Digital Media at the Crossroads annual conference is coming up in January 20th to the 21st. Um, so our group was specifically so that students could get together and talk about the content, but also like, you know, get past the uh, let's just talk, let's just hear about what's going on from industry professionals. Let's actually, you know, have real conversations with each other. Um, so Thank yous, first of all, to Peter Grant and uh, the entire Digital Media at the Crossroads DM at X committee, as well as our DM at Extra steering committee and our experts. I'd also like to thank Catherine Moore and her class for attending and for having us uh, today. Now, for this specific event, this is our second In the Weeds speaker series, um, where our experts really dig down into the weeds, as it were, to the topic to provide us with some of the important policy considerations. Um, so that's the in the weeds part. And then offer us questions to consider. Uh, following the actual conversation, uh, the presentation part is the special DM at extra touch. That's the part where we actually talk to each other um, about the content we've heard and our thoughts. So I'm also going to drop the agenda in the chat for, for those um, for, so that you can see what we're going to do. But basically, we're going to have two expert speaker sessions followed by brief Q&As and short breaks. And then we'll move on to the final section where we get to talk to each other and, and um, kind of hash out what's, what's been discussed. Uh, so finally, I'm pleased to stop talking and turn things over to our industry and policy experts. So we have Aaron Finley, who is a partner at Stone Hay, Cafazzo, Dem Dembrowski, Heim, and Finley, and also the former chief legal officer at the Canadian Media Producers Association. And with Aaron today, we have Doug Barrett, Douglas Barrett, who's a founding member of DM at Extra and a member of the DM at X committee. <clears throat> He's also adjunct professor in the Arts, Media, and Entertainment MBNA at Schulich School of Business um, and uh, former board chair of the Canadian TV Fund. So I'm really excited to hear uh, what we have to, um, what they have to say to us today about copyright collectives. Uh, okay. Okay, it's over to me, I think. Yes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Nice to uh, see you all remotely, virtually. Um, I do want to thank Diamond Extra and uh, Catherine for inviting me to speak today. Uh, both Doug and I are uh, really interested in this topic, and we think you will be as well. The focus of today's conversation is going to be on copyright collectives. And what we've titled the presentation is Copyright Collectives Are Dead, Long May They Reign. There's a lot of controversy right now about whether collectives are serving the purpose that they are intended to serve. And so we thought it would be an interesting uh, discussion discussion and interesting to hear from all of you about uh, your thoughts around that. But in order to get there, as Jessica mentioned, we do have to dig into the weeds. And that's why I'm here. I'm going to take you through the weeds so that you can make informed policy decisions or have an informed conversation at the end of the afternoon. So fingers crossed my PowerPoint works here. Let's see. There's a few windows open. Okay. So as an agenda, uh, Jessica has posted it in the chat as well, but I'm going to start off very briefly with the problem collectives are meant to solve to try to frame out the conversation we're going to have. And then we get into the weeds. So I thought we, we needed to talk about copyright 101. Off the top, we will focus in on music copyright specifically because we are in Catherine's class. 
um, because a number of you are, are music professionals or are certainly interested in music and because music copyright and the way collectives act in uh, the music industry are quite complex. And I think it's an interesting foundation for the conversation later on. Then we'll move into a, a short Q&A and we'll take a break. After that, uh, chapter two, collectives are dead. We'll talk about disruption um, in the collective copyright collective space and move into some Q and A's there as well. And chapter three, long may they reign. That's when we look to the future and uh, move into breakout room discussions so that uh, you can all discuss what you think the future of copyright collectives is. So let's start from the start, except this is a very sort of high level, broad policy discussion about the problems that collectives are meant to solve. So fundamentally, um, the question is, how do we get intangible property or content that creators create from creators to users while ensuring that the creators are compensated or recognized for those creations? And how do we ensure that that compensation or recognition is at a level that incentivizes creators to create the next big thing or their next work? And there's a couple of, of things to think about here. One, we're talking about incentivizing creation and probably more specifically incentivizing professional creation. There's always an argument that creators will create because they're creators and that's what creators do. But there is a point where to be a professional creator, to make money and a living off of your creation, you do need to be rewarded for that. So thinking about that in this discussion, I think helps to frame some of the questions. We also want to incentivize dissemination. We want to encourage creators to actually put their work out there. Um, not a whole lot of value in a creator that creates something um, or an artist that creates something but doesn't want to share it with the world because they won't be compensated or rewarded or some other reason. So we're incentivizing both creation as well as dissemination. We want to ensure that the public um, or users both have access to those creations. And again, that creators are compensated or recognized or rewarded for their work. So this is fundamentally copyright policy. And our system requires a balancing out of these three or four um, objectives here. And the question we're looking at today is what role copyright collectives serve in this virtuous cycle? I call this a virtuous cycle. And my argument is always that there's a public interest in ensuring that each of these things happen. Sometimes we talk about the public interest in access to content only. But my argument, some people agree with me, some people don't, is that there's also a public interest in ensuring that creators create, in ensuring that creators disseminate their works, and ensuring that creators are compensated for those creations. So I say public interest in all four of these objectives, and we want to make sure they're balanced out so that this virtuous cycle continues. And if we have the balance right, we're going to see a chain of events in which one desirable occurrence leads to another and lifts the entire system. So we continue to promote the creation and so on, and we result in this continuous process of improvement. That's what a virtuous cycle is. So that's the very philosophical um, policy objective for copyright and also um, also collectives and their role in that system. A little bit less theoretical and a little more practical, a little, I didn't say completely practical, but a little bit. This is a description from the World Intellectual Property Office about the problems collectives are meant to solve. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you think about heavy uses of copyright protected works, if we think about in the olden days, radio stations, television stations or broadcasters, performance venues, stadiums, festivals, theaters, fitness centers, dentist's office, restaurant, bars, any place that is a heavy user of music, those are all music examples, but other copyright protected content as well. Um, thinking about all of the rights that flow in those places, um, 
managing those rights individually may not be realistic. So what WIPO says is an author, performer, producer, for instance, cannot contact every single radio station to negotiate licenses and remuneration for the use of their songs. And on the flip side, it's also not practical for a radio station to seek specific permission from every author, performer, producer for the use of each song. So collectives, their role, CMO is a collective management organization. They facilitate rights clearances in the interest of both parties and ensure that there's an economic reward for rights holders. And so if we think about how essentially impossible it would be for users or the aggregators or the platforms, broadcasters, to contact every single rights holder for every single work that they use. And similarly, how impossible it is for a rights holder to monitor, license, or enforce their rights. Um, we have a broken system. So users want to use and they want to use legally and authors or creators want their works to be used and they want them to be used lawfully. They wanna connect the two. If we don't have something that, that helps us in the middle, the system is broken. We have an inefficient market or a completely, not just inefficient, ineffective, a broken market. And that's exactly where collectives are intended to step in. The idea is that they'll facilitate or create an efficient functioning market for the exchange of copyright protected works. And these is typically in cases where the market on its own won't be efficient. So some of the things to think about here as we go through and dig even deeper into the weeds, get ready, is does the system still work? Is it fulfilling its purpose? Maybe it is in some cases and not in others. Is it efficient? Is it necessary? what should be changed, if anything, and what would a new system look like if you think the system is, is broken? Um, to get to those questions, again, we have to get into the weeds and you have to understand the weeds at, at a fairly level to appreciate the system as a whole and to make decisions about where we go in the future. So here we go, hopefully. The weeds. I'm gonna kind of fly through copyright um, well, we'll see. I'll try and fly through copyright. So again, why do we have copyright at all? The whole purpose of copyright is to protect copyright owners while promoting creativity and the orderly exchange of idea, ideas. That's what the Canadian Intellectual Property Office says. We have a couple of cases in Canada. Uh, Taberge is one of the leading cases. It's probably 20 years old now, but it talks about balancing the public interest in the encouragement dissemination of works of the arts and intellect and obtaining a just reward for the creator. And we have a new, um, newish case or a newer case came out last year, the Supreme Court saying that copyright is all about the balance between access and incentive. So all of these sort of um, reasons, all of these reasons are why we have copyright at all. Um, copyright is protected internationally. We're, we are signatories to a number of different international copyright treaties. Fundamentally, we've agreed that we will grant um, certain minimum protections, um, meaning national treatment, which means that we will treat foreign creators the same as we treat Canadian creators in Canada. If their works are being used in Canada, all authors are treated the same. There is protection without formality, meaning that you don't have to um, register your copyright to have copyright in the work. You don't have to register your work. You don't have to put the little C with a circle around it. There's protection without those formalities. And we've also agreed um, to so certain minimum standards of protection and certain limitations and exceptions for some reason with a big S on my screen um, to economic rights. Broadly, what you really need to know is that there's a worldwide um, interconnectivity of this copyright policy and copyright laws. Okay. So what does copyright protect? There's actually two plus, plus, plus um, types of of copyrights using that word loosely. There are copyrights and there are related rights. So 
copyrights protect literary, dramatic, musical, and artistic works, which are exactly what you think they would be. Literary works are books or magazines or newspapers, um, poems, dramatic works, screenplays, musical, music. Um, I should say compositions. Musical works are compositions, the uh, sheet music, the actual song, not the recording of the song that sits on the other side. So the song itself, artistic works, paintings, f photographs, sculpture, things like that. Related rights are, are linked to copyright, but they're slightly different. I'm not going to get into much detail about the differences between the two, but related rights protect very specific other types of works. Sound recording, so the master sound recording, um, performers performances as well as communication signals and I will break that down a little bit in a slide or two. Copyright protects works that are original, only original, they have to be original to attract copyright protection. It can be a derivative of something that already exists, but in order for it to attract protection on the new bits, the new bits must be original. Can't be a verbatim or a, a it can't be a copy of something that already exists that doesn't attract a new copyright. Copyright only express only protects expressions of ideas. It doesn't protect ideas themselves. Ideas belong to the public domain. It similarly uh, doesn't protect facts. Facts belong to all of us. They are free for the taking, part of the public domain. And the idea expression dichotomy, people often ask me, what are you talking about? Here's an example from a show I watched last night. The idea of warring families um, over a throne, one of which of those families owns dragons, is an idea. It's not a very original idea either, but it's an idea. Game of Thrones is the expression of that idea and all of the books, the names I can't remember. So expression of an idea is what's protected, not the idea itself. And um, the term of copyright, let's just go with life plus 70 years. We're about to change our laws so that all works are protected for the life of the author and an additional 70 years after that. So once an author dies, the author's beneficiaries continue to reap the benefits of the work of the original author um, for an additional 70 years. And that is uh, international norm. We're pretty much in 70 years around the world. Some countries have longer terms of protection, like Mexico has, I think, 100 years. Um, but that's when we move from 50 to 70 years, we're looking more like like uh, the rest of the world. How am I doing, Doug? Any questions to clarify so far? Big thumbs up. Moving on. So uh, the subject matter. Um, again, copyright, literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works. Authors are generally the first owners of copyright in those works. There's a couple of exceptions to that. One is in Canada, a work created in the course of employment belongs to the employer. So if I'm employed by, hmm, who should I work for today? I don't know. I'm going to go work for Napster today. If I write some things, does Napster still exist? I think so. If I, um, if I work on things, I'm paid to work to create things. I'm paid to draft this PowerPoint presentation for, Na for Napster. I feel like Napster wouldn't like this presentation, but that's okay. Um, Napster, my employer, is the owner of copyright in that work that I produce as part of my job. Um, in the US, there's a, a concept in, baked into their Copyright Act called work for hire. And we see it a lot in Canada, but it's absolutely not applicable in Canada. People just get them confused. But um, in the US, in for certain types of works, the commissioning party is the first owner. So if a, a television producer commissions a work, commissions a screen, and I won't use that example, television producer um, brings music into a uh, television program, the producer is the owner of the audiovisual work, of the program itself. So that's work for hire concept. And copyright, typically we're talking about for the rights holders, authors, 
publishers, book publishers, newspaper publishers, playwrights, composers, music publishers, and artists. And the publishers, um, both the, the book or literary publishers and the music publishers become copyright owners by virtue of contracts with the original authors. So a newspaper publisher will enter into a contract with a journalist um, and they may or may not become the owner of copyright in the work, but that's how they become rights holders. Same with music publishers, typically enter into a contract with a composer and uh, they agree to exploit the song in exchange for a share of royalties and a portion of copyright ownership in the song. On the related rights side, find my clicker. We're talking about labels, record labels, performers and broadcasters. Those are the those are the owners of the related rights. And because we're digging into music copyright specifically, what I need you to remember, want you to remember, and you will hear it for those who are in Catherine's class, you will hear this again and again from different speakers. Think of two pieces of a song of recorded music, the composition, meaning the song, meaning the uh, sheet music and the master sound recording. Those are the big ones you need to think about all the time. They're different rights. One's a copyright, one's a related right. They have slightly different rights attached to them. They are owned by very different parties. Composition is owned by the composer slash music publisher and the master sound recording is owned by the label. So when we're um, talking about the exchange of one song that's been recorded, you have to think about those layers of rights holders on both sides. And there may be multiple owners of the copyright on the composition side, particularly in the hit music space. You bet. Absolutely. Um, if we think so about- Presumably the life of those authors plus 70 years is the life of all of them plus- The, the life of, the, yeah, the last living author the plus 70 living, years. Yeah. 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 So the rights, oh, you know what? I want to back up one, one second here. So in particular, recognizing how important the day is today, I do want to highlight that this is the system we have today. And this is so far from my area of expertise, I'm learning like the rest of us are. But I did want to touch on the nature of Indigenous um, people's intellectual property and copyright. And because it's it's quite a different concept than the structure we've put around copyright and intellectual property in our laws today. And so indigenous um, intellectual property is often inseparable from spiritual, cultural, social, and economic aspects of indigenous life. And the notion of collective ownership of that property is not really addressed well well at all in our current both domestic and international intellectual property law and it's really the protection of indigenous ip is is really dependent on the governments um, around the world frankly adopting effective domestic legislation that clearly protects the intellectual property of indigenous peoples in their own territories there's a number of initiatives there's been a lot of research done over the last really long time um, and there's a lot more work to be done, but I didn't want to leave this um, without touching on that, just so that we're aware that there are much bigger conversations happening, um, happening around these issues around the world. And one place to look, and I think we may have some other resources in the chat, but one place to look is certainly WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Office. They've done a number of studies if you're interested in, in digging in further, and I, I do recommend it to get a, an accurate picture of what we're talking about. Okay, so the rights, the actual rights you get when you own a copyright, when you have a copyright, um, you get the sole right to produce or reproduce the work, the right to perform the work or any substantial part of the work. So anyone can reproduce or produce or perform an insubstantial part of a song. But we don't really know what an insubstantial part of a song is. I mean, we can we can do a legal analysis, but whenever someone asks me, isn't 10 seconds of a song an insubstantial part? No, it's 
absolutely not. That's not codified anywhere. And that's not what our law says. The question of whether, um, whether a substantial part is copied depends both on the amount copied as well as how important the bit copied is to the work as a whole. So reproduce and the right to perform the work. The performance work, publicly perform, publicly performing, <laughs> let me try that one more time. Public performance is also uh, includes a communication to the public by telecommunication. So there's a public performance, there's uh, you know, a broadcaster broadcasting a uh, radio station, music that's embedded within, the, um, within that transmission is a public performance and also a communication to the public. So that's what copyright protects. The main ones are reproduction and public performance. Uh, related rights, oh, I'll go back to uh, moral rights in a second, but related rights are typically generally thought of as a right to be paid um, as opposed to a full copyright. Again, I'm not going to get into that today, but in the rights of the performer's performance include the right to communicate, perform, fix, and rent that performance. And in a sound recording include the rights to publish, reproduce, rent, make available, or communicate to the public, and also to sell the physical object. So they're close, they're similar, they're not identical. Again, composition, sound recording, slightly different rights, different owners. Just I'm going to keep repeating that. Moral rights around the world. Um, moral rights protect the rights of the author. They're really considered to be droit d'auteur. They belong to the author only. The author cannot assign moral rights or license moral rights to anyone else. They never sit with a corporation. No corporation, including my employer, has moral rights in my work. It always sticks with the author. And what we see is um, usually moral rights are waived when we go to exploit um, someone's copyright. Uh, and moral rights are effectively, essentially, the right to be um, to receive attribution or to not receive attribution with the work, and the right to, um, to control or prevent association with a cause or, or um, or a product or service that you don't agree with. So if those things are infringed to the honor or reputation of the author, we say the moral rights have been infringed. So just something to think about, moral rights stick with the authors, are, are part of the author's droit d'auteur, um, and around the world, that those are recognized as well. So all of these are a big bundle of different rights and a layering of rights. And we will dig into the specific rights holders in a minute so that you can see the complexities here. But the reason we get into the weeds is exactly for this reason. It's, it's complex. There's a lot of different rights and a lot of different rights holders um, in this bundle of rights and layering of rights. And each rights holder has their own set of rights and their own ability to exploit, authorize the use, copy, perform the work, um, all of those things. So that's why the weeds matters. A couple of quick things. Um, copyright, it protects intangible property. So physical possession does not equal copyright ownership. I think we pr probably know that by now. Um, it's a statutory right. It only exists because it's codified in thick legal books in the olden days and thick, long uh, websites, I guess, <laughs> these days. Uh, worldwide protection, protection around the world because of our treaties. Uh, copyright is assignable, so you can completely transfer the ownership of your copyrights to another party. It's licensable, so when we grant a license, we're giving someone permission to use our thing rather than transferring ownership. And it's licen licensable exclusively, non-exclusively on a, a sole and exclusive basis. Um, and it's also infinitely divisible. So you can take a song, if I'm the rights holder in a song, I can license it upside down backwards and divide it all up by the specific rights I have in it, by the territories I want to you to be able to exploit and the territories I want to 
um, I want to retain for myself or license to someone else by uses. And uh, it really is in infinitely divisible. So before we get into music specifically, again, can I, think, can I yeah? throw something in? Mm -hmm. one, one of the things that's impressed me about this whole area is how the globe, and we're not talking decades old, we're talking a couple of centuries old, seem to figure out a way with all the complexities and all the challenges to communication, et cetera, to develop a common system for dealing with intangibles. It, it doesn't exist in terms of dealing with personal property or real property. The only other area I can think of where the globe has kind of on its own across all the language and culture barriers come up with a single solution has to do with um, finance and the preparation of financial statements for companies. Um, so in order to have a, a worldwide market in intangibles, there's this solution and the principles you've enunciated apply in general everywhere. Uh, and, and I just find that a remarkable thing. Thanks, That's Doug. It. That's it. That's my whole thing. <laughs> it's not your whole thing, I hope. <laughs> so super quick infringement, copyright infringement, when someone without permission does something only the copyright owner can do. There's a number of exceptions or defenses or users rights to copyright infringement. Um, there's a lot of very specific exceptions in particular for museums, archives and libraries and educational institutions. Uh, we also have kind of broader exceptions like fair dealing in Canada or fair use. Um, in the US. And this is, a, a, again, a 20 year old quote, but just the importance of exceptions in this balancing act. Um, CCH and the Law Society Supreme Court said, the fair dealing exception, like other exceptions is a user's right. And this was the first time we talked about exceptions to copyright infringement as users rights. And the court said in order to maintain the proper balance, between the rights of a copyright owner and user's interests, it must not be interpreted restrictively. So exceptions, user's rights are um, critical to this, this balancing out. Okay. The weeds, music, whoa, what happened there? I'm gonna start going faster if you can believe it. Okay, music, the subject matter. We have musical works, which are compositions, sound recordings, and performers' performances. The rights holders, songwriters and composers, music publishers, makers, which are the record labels typically, and performers are the rights holders of copyright and related rights in music. And the rights are the reproduction, communication to the public, and a few other related rights. Again, I've said this a few times. I think you got it. Compositions, musical works are separately protected from the sound recording. Two different works, one is a copyright, one's a related right, two different rights holders or many different rights holders, but record labels on the master sound recording side, songwriters, music publishers on the composition side. Same thing, just a different way of looking at it because I like to try to make these kind of charts. So songwriters, composers, and music publishers have interest in the composition, makers in the sound recording, performers in the performance that lands on the sound recording. Those are your authors and owners. Okay, we got to copyright collectives. Again, the problem that collectives are meant to solve. And I'm zoning in on music here. Um, because this is the class we're in. So again, thinking of all the potential uses of a piece of recorded music, the bundle of rights that are afforded to copyright owners, and the number of rights holders that a single piece of music might have, or number the number of songwriters that a single piece of music might have. As an example, the use of music on the internet triggers the right of reproduction on the originating server, a communication to the public in the originating country, maybe, probably, yes, definitely the making available right, which is part of the communication right, 
in the originating country, the a communicating, sorry, a communication to the public in a receiving country, a reproduction in the receiving country. So you can see why this, this connection between our, with our treaties and the recognition of rights matters. Um, all of those rights are triggered in relation to the song or the musical composition, the sound recording and the performer's performance. And they all belong to composers, lyricists, music publishers, performing artists, and makers of the sound recording. So when we think of an online streaming service, iTunes, Spotify, Sirius, or radio, sta radio stations, television broadcasters, performance venues, all the things I mentioned earlier, think about that magnified for online use. It's essentially zillions of microtransactions. I didn't measure it. I just went with zillions. It seems, seemed right to me. Um, probably every day, but I don't know. Sure. Think about user uploaded content and how difficult that would be to track all of the rights that are triggered, all of the rights holders uses that are triggered, um, and how impossible it would be for the users, even the platforms or the broadcasters or whoever it is, to contact every single rights holder for every single work used, and how difficult or impossible it would be for a rights holder to monitor, license, and enforce as well. Again, that's where CMOs step in. And the idea, again, is to facilitate or create an efficient functioning market for this exchange of copyright protected works. Copyright collectives monitor, negotiate, license, and collect. So they monitor where, when, how, what works are used, or they are, or they receive information. They don't necessarily monitor, but they certainly receive data on that. They negotiate um, licenses or tariffs and other conditions with users. They license the works of um, on behalf of their members and the rights holders that they represent. They collect the fees from users and distribute those fees to the rights holders. This is the definition in the Canadian Copyright Act about what a collective uh, copyright collective is. And I think we call it a collective society. Well, I know we do because it's on the screen. So collective society carries on the business of collective administration of copyright or the remuneration right, who by assignment, grant of license, appointment as an agent or otherwise operates a licensing scheme and carries on the business of collecting and distributing royalties or levies. And at its core, the only requirement is that a collective license on behalf of more than one rights holder. You could theoretically have a collective that represents two rights holders. I don't know of any, but you could. And there's lots of different structures. Um, they typically license on a blanket, blanket basis, meaning you take a license with me, you user, take up a license with me or pay a tariff with me collective, and I will grant you the rights in our, my entire repertoire. So every rights holder I represent, all of the works that those rights holders own, I will license you the right to do X, Y, and Z um, on behalf for all of the works in our repertoire on behalf of all of the rights holders. And a collective can license one user or a group of users. So a, a copyright collective could license YouTube alone and look at the types of uses that YouTube makes, the amount of money they think they think or they can negotiate for those uses um, and negotiate a license on that basis. Or they could uh, license or file a tariff um, to more than one user. So uh, or group of users, a type of users. So um, online music services. So there's a tariff that applies to online music services. There's a tariff that applies to commercial radio broadcasters. There's tariffs or licenses, or there were, that applied to all post-secondary educational institutions. So when the users look 
generally the same and their uses look generally the same, a collective will negotiate with a group of users or license a group of users on the same terms. So how do they work? The authors and rights holders or copyright owners grant rights to the collective to manage their copyright or their related rights. And the collective either negotiates licenses with users directly, or it applies for tariffs that are ultimately certified by the Copyright Board of Canada. As I mentioned, the users can be individual or group, group or class of users, and the collective negotiates on behalf of, of usually a significant number of rights holders and represents a large repertoire. The user then gets a license to use all the works in the collective's repertoire for the uses that are set out in the license or tariff in exchange for a payment of royalty to the collective. The collective takes an administration fee off the top of those collections and then distributes the royalties out to the individual rights holders. And there's different ways of distributing, but the gold standard would be something like a full reporting license. I'm sure it's called different things, but a full reporting license or tariff where the user reports on every single use. It knows how many times that song was played on the radio over the year, full reporting license. And so we know exactly what uses of what works have occurred and the royalty pool is split according to that usage. And so if your song is played more on the radio than another song, you get more money. And there's other variations of that um, kind of moving down from the gold standard. Sometimes collectives uh, conduct surveys. Um, sometimes distributions are based on market share. There's, there's various ways of, of doing it. And then collectives also have reciprocal agreements with other copyright collectives around the world for an international exchange of repertoire. So if I'm a collective in Canada licensing post-secondary educational institutions to copy books, I have agreements with 120 other countries around the world, their repertoire, all of those foreign books come into my repertoire as well. So I can license that to the Canadian users. So my repertoire, is not just Canadian owned content, it's worldwide. I need to breathe, Doug. But you're doing so well. <laughs> Maybe I'll talk about the copyright board for a minute. Well, the Copyright Board is a federally created tribunal, so it operates under the provisions of the Copyright Act. And certain groups like the Canadian Association of Broadcasters would have tariffs uh, approved by the Copyright Board so that um, they pay a percentage of their gross revenues, broadcasters do, to the applicable collective. And then the collective um, has mathematical ways of analyzing the weight of use of the particular songs and paying the money out. So, um, and that there's a certain amount of trust uh, built into the system, but the copyright board hearings are very legal, experts are cross-examined, um, the, you know, the um, creators have lawyers working for them or the collectives have lawyers working for them who are very skilled at this. I think Erin has done this a lot herself. Um, and uh, so they're applying to keep the tariffs as low as possible and the, or in the case of the collectives as high as possible and obviously the broadcasters on the other side. Um, so it's in a sense a battle between two collective groups and then the individual broadcast uh, operations adhere to the tariff that the that the copyright board approves. How am I doing? Great. Um, okay. Yeah, the the copyright board is there essentially as a um, a check on. I, I would say a couple of things. It's there as a check on the potential monopoly power or abuse of monopoly power of a collective. If you think of a collective um, representing the world of songs. Um, they could theoretically hold um, hold those songs hostage and charge exorbitant rates to use them because they're the only ones you can 
um, the collective is the only place you can obtain a license to use the song legally. So the board is there to, to check that price. Um, and uh, a tariff is, is sort of that rate setting or price setting exercise for the use of any copyright protected works. I would say though too, that the board is there to check on potential user power as well. Um, you know, an unreasonable user wants a license but refuses to negotiate a reasonable rate, a collective can go to the copyright board and have an in this independent arbiter decide what the fair market rate is for, um, for the use of those works. And I think sometimes um, some organizations, you mentioned a gym, a gym would not wake up in the morning and say, that when it plays a radio station to all the people in the gym, that it's actually performing a copyright work. And so um, it would have no resources and have no interest in trying to negotiate individually to get those songs. So once they receive the unfortunate news that they have to pay for that music <laughs> to, to all the people who are exercising, um, they're quite happy to belong to a collective group that makes sure those rates are reasonable. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so with the last couple of minutes before we break, maybe I always say that and I'm like, oh, there's 10 more pages. Um, collective management of musical works and recorded music. So the reproduction right we looked at, some examples, commercial radio, satellite radio, online music services. Um, these tariffs, licenses are payable to that should say Canadian Musical Reproduction Rights Agency, CMRA, and SOCAN, uh, formerly SODRAC, in Canada for the right to reproduce the composition. Uh, royalties are payable to Connect and SOPROC for the right to reproduce the sound recording. And they're payable to Artisti, MROC, Actra, Rax for the right to reproduce the perform performer's performance in the sound recording. Communication right or the public performance right radio, television, concert, streaming over the internet, payable to SOCAN for the right to publicly perform or communicate the composition and payable to ReSound to, for the right to publicly perform or communicate the sound recording. And another way to look at this, which is probably just more complicated than my last slide, is this one. So, um, so songwriters, composers, music publishers are represented by CMRA and SOCAN on the reproduction side. And SOCAN purchased uh, SODRAC a couple of years ago. So I keep SODRAC in there just in case people think I've forgotten about SODRAC. Um, performers are represented by Artisti, MROC, and Actra Rax. Makers are represented by Connect, SOPROC, and Adisc. And ReSound is actually an umbrella collective that its members are Connect, SOPROC, Artisti, MROC, and Actra Rax. And by virtue of that, they represent the makers and performers. So crystal clear? Yeah, I thought so. The good news is we can give you these slides. A couple of other, uh, other collectives, um, things to think about. So there is a private copying, Canadian private copying collective in Canada that copies, uh, there's a levy in our act that's paid by importers and manufacturers on the sale of quote blank, I mean blank quote audio recording media, which right now is CDs only. And CPCC is another umbrella collective, shares royalties between SOCAN, CMRA and SODRAC, ReSound and ReSound. ReSound for performers and ReSound for makers. There'll, so be, a the There'll be a test a collective on this. of collectives. Correct. Both ReSound and CPCC are collectives of collectives. We do have collectives and collective administration of copyright related rights in other, um, other areas, audiovisual works. Um, the rights holders in audiovisual works or in the retransmission regime, broadcasters, producers, which own the content that is transmitted, as well as sports leagues. Um, broadcasters have copyright and communication signals and producers sports league have copyright in the programs. And there's a retransmission copyright collective regime that says under copyright law, a uh, retransmitter would need the authorization of everyone 
that holds copyright in the programs and the signals, except we structured that there's an exception for retransmitters provided the retransmitter pay, pays royalties. So that's what's referred to as a compulsory regime. The only way to get paid your retransmission royalties is if you sign up with one of the, I don't know, nine collectives that represent retransmission rights. And retransmission here would be like us getting the Calgary CTV station in Toronto. Yeah, exactly. Um, literary works. We have um, rights holders or authors and publishers. The collectives represent the reproduction and communication to the public rights. We're talking about paper and digital reproductions of books, magazines, journals, and newspapers. These collectives are licensing just portions of works. It's a um, general regime, voluntary regime, so that the rights holders still have the right to license directly, but they give the collectives the right to license portions. Um, two collectives here in Canada, Access Copyright represents the English side and Copyback the French side. That's literary works. Um, and then for completion, we also have collective administration of artistic works, Kark, Sodart, and Sodrak, now Sokan. Can I just say, to add, to make it a little simpler, that if you're a creator, a career creator in one area, uh, you have, and you are a professional, you would have some kind of support through your agent. Uh, and you would also have a, some legal representation. I think this comes with almost every full-time professional creator. So what happens is that kind of porridge of collectives uh, really boils down to the particular route that applies to you. So if you're a, a, a song writer, a composer, for instance, you would have only one or two of those tracks and you would focus on those tracks and you'd become pretty familiar with how they operate. It's only the incredibly crazy people like Aaron who know about all of them. <laughs> so I do think it gets simpler uh, when it gets down to the specific creative area that you're working in. I, is that a fair is that a fair statement? It, it is. Um, and I think from the user perspective, though, you do have to be aware of when you make a particular use of a song. So let's say you're an online music service. Um, you make a particular use of a, of a catalog of songs. You have to be aware that we're talking about the performers, the labels, as well as the, the um, songwriters, composers, music publishers and that different collectives represent different rights that each of those have. So you're actually paying, you may be paying four or five different collectives, typically, at least historically, through copyright board certified tariffs, but you are paying a number of different collectives for what is conceptually one use, running an online music service. Right. We're at Q&A. Jessica, do we see any? Uh, not quite yet. So what I'm going to say is, please, if you have questions, uh, pop them in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I have questions, uh -oh. <laughs> um, but they, they are probably not uh, difficult and may not even be things that you can answer. Um, <laughs> although I would like to, to um, complicate Doug's last point there about, uh, I think that increasingly individuals have to know more than what they used to because increasingly we have individual creators who are navigating their own spaces uh, online to try and get a bigger piece of the pie because there's it's like pennies um, that they get from the streaming services and the um you know so i think increasingly they are uh going out there but not necessarily knowing all of the different ways that they could or should um, be both protecting their IP, but also um, incentivizing their IP. Uh, and, 
you know, I, and that that's an argument either way. Like, does that mean collectives are helping them, could be mm -hmm. helping them or hurting them or, you know, and I don't have an answer. I don't know if you want to comment. <laughs> Aaron nodded a little when I said that, but no, you're right. About the I, increasing part, not about the. Yeah, no, I was, I was thinking that um, it is important for individual creators to understand mm -hmm. all the pools of money that they can access and access fairly easily. Frankly, you sign up. Um, most of them don't require a full um, assignment of your rights, so you retain your rights, but you're you're signing up for the collectives to collect this piece of the royalty that you might not otherwise be able to collect because you can't chase everybody all of the time. Yeah. Um, so I think it is important to understand if you're wearing your label hat, if you're if you're producing yourself and yes. you're making your own masters. Um, you're the label. Yep. So you can be um, affiliated with all of the, <laughs> some of the collectives I mentioned and collect that maker share. Yeah, you get um, to be on both you're sides. You're a publisher, you. right? If you're a songwriter, composer, you're, you can also be a publisher. Many are. Um, and so you're, you should be collecting from all the right places. And look, the collectives are incredibly helpful to call them up um, and ask whether you are eligible and to fill out their forms, they're incredibly helpful. They want you in their repertoire and they want to represent you. So, um, and they're used to answering questions all of the time. So you can certainly call them. Um, and also the copyright board has a full list of all of the collectives that are out there just for sport, but also to see where, where you might fit in. Uh, and just as an added, many uh, local organizations also provide support in push you towards uh, uh sure. um, finding that that money uh so there is a question how does this apply to nfts does blockchain replace the collectives oh we knew the blockchain question was <laughs> going to come up at some point didn't we <laughs> i think i intentionally didn't put blockchain in my um in my notes that are coming up because i think that's a question that you need to park um to the roundtable discussions yeah i think so um, too yeah but um it, nfts i mean it it could apply they could apply to nfts if there was a collective representing whoever owns the nfts there's lots of lots of different types of rights holders that own rights in nfts um if some common group of rights holders decided to band together and or give their rights in their NFTs or license their rights to a collective, sure, you could, um, that could work um, as long as there's copyright protection embedded within the NFT somewhere, if it's an artistic work. Um, yep, probably, maybe. I, no one's done it yet. Yeah, I think the thing about NFTs is that they're, they're just not, um, uh, they're, they're just there isn't policy written yeah. uh, in the same way. So it's still a little bit of a wild west in terms of what you can and can't do mm -hmm. um, it, right, in terms of regulatory processes. So the next question is what, now this is a really big question. <laughs> what main issues do independent creators usually run into in terms of copyright, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing? Hmm. That is a big question. Um, I mean, I think we touched on it, right? Indep if, if we're talking about little independent, um, knowing where, knowing the rights that you have and knowing what you're entitled to exploit and where the royalty pools of money might be, I think that's uh, a big issue. And if you are running your own business, if you're a creator and managing your business, um, you really got to verse yourself on on all of these intricacies to make sure you're not that you're participating right to ensure you're not missing out on all of this i'm not sure that's what the question is asking but I, it's kind of a fat question i think i think well, there's somebody here i think um <clears throat> another thing to to think about in terms of this question from the creator's perspective as opposed to like the the lawyer's perspective is um that like one of the things that comes up is um, people making use of your, mm -hmm. your, your IP. Um, and I think we probably can't answer this question in, in terms of a way to help. Um, but 
uh, offices and organizations that support independent music creators. So I, I'm in Nova Scotia, so I know that Music Nova Scotia, for example, um, offers workshops for uh, independent creators and new creators at any level, but particularly people who are, are interested in um, controlling their own IP, their own produ production, their own whatever, um, it, and helps them like recognize what are those issues, but also work through how do I control my own IP? Mm -hmm. What do I do? Do I join a collective? Do I not? Um, and uh, how do I how do I approach SoCan? How do I deal with my stuff on on SoundCloud? And you know where do I put this stuff? And I, I think those are the spaces that can help with that kind of. But I I don't know if we're answering that question because I think some of this issue is we're we're talking from a, a top down kind of conversation yep. here too. Is that? I don't know if that helps. I did have another question. It was about YouTube and YouTube being its own nation, but I'm going to leave that and maybe we'll. It's coming up. In terms of, uh, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> excellent. So, uh, excellent. Thank I, I you. I have a question. Me. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, Doug. <laughs> the, these are nonprofit organizations. Um, uh, uh, there's lots of ways of nonprofit organizations governing themselves. I assume that they all, or at least many of them, have creator representation on their boards of directors. Yep. So there'd be a, um, um, and th that creator representation would reflect the repertoire that they're representing, whatever that repertoire is. How am I doing so far? Good. So, so they're so not all non. They're not all nonprofit. Some are for okay. profit. Um, but I think the majority are not for profit and yeah, they are, uh, generally, at least historically constituency based. So if, you know, access copyright represents authors and publishers, half the board is authors and half is publishers, at least in the olden days. And that way, the strategic discussions, the strategic decisions, the distribution policies, um, the board is is representing those sort of constituencies to make sure they've got the um, the policies that will best reflect the membership. But that's that's changed a little bit over the years as well with with different governance structures. But yeah, typically they will they will certainly have representation from their membership on the boards. Right. And does the cost of operating the uh, collective ever become an issue? Or is the, are there guidelines that just about how you structure yourself and how many staff you should have and so on? Yeah, so there's there are definitely guidelines and there are international, of course. There's umbrellas of of umbrellas of collectives. Um, there's international organizations that set those best practices and guidelines, and one of them is certainly that your administration or your cost of doing business um, doesn't exist exceed the uh, the distributions. So there's a point not just doesn't exceed, but it's reasonable. Um, there is a point where um, and I, I can give an example because it's public now, but we've recently started to fold a collective because the cost of administration were too high as compared to the royalties we were collecting. So I'm on the board of a collective that just decided to do that because the royalties have dropped over the years and our admin costs, even with two staff, was was too high in comparison to what we were we were about to distribute. So it's not it's not reasonable anymore. And when so you, you say, wind it down, when you say fold or wind it down, and I was on a call the other day with Stephen Ellis. Is this the one you're? It is. <laughs> um, it, and he was referring to this. What happens to that repertoire? Is it assigned to somebody else or just you set the the, the members? What, what do you do? You can, there's different different mechanisms. You could sell, you could sell the rights, um, assuming you have the right to do that in your affiliation agreements. You could find another collective to step in. Um, you could just terminate the affiliations and send the rights holders back to um, to figure out how to collect the royalties from someone else. So different ways of doing it. Okay, everyone, welcome back. Uh, and uh, this section will be shorter, but it will be just as packed with information. 
Okay, go ahead. Aaron. This is this is the thinking section. We've given you the weeds. Now we're going to move on to the policy or bigger bigger questions, perhaps. So if if we think about um, about the function of copyright collectives and how they operate, there's an inherent tension here, or number of tensions. If you can have more than two, um, more than one tension. Collectives are sometimes exclusive licensees or full assignees of copyright, meaning that they hold the rights and the rights holder can't uh, exploit the rights or do anything with them. It all sits with the collective. Um, that means that a collective can hold all the rights for all the rights holders that they represent. And so in some cases, collectives are monopolies. And monopolies are not necessarily or inherently bad. People think monopoly is a bad word, not necessarily, but monopolies do have the potential to charge exorbitant prices or excessive rents and lock up works so that no one can use them. So there is an argument out there that the collective administration of copyright actually creates monopolies, statutorily blessed monopolies that lead to economic inefficiencies. Collectives also don't, I was going to say normally, but I think ever, charge different royalty rates for different works. So payments that are made to copyright holders for copying those works may not reflect the actual value of copying that work. It may not reflect the value of that work at all because it's spread out over everyone's works. It's a very socialist system. Um, the total amount is spread out of everyone over everyone's um, works and therefore everyone is receiving theoretically the same amount of money per song or per work. Um, if it's copied more, you will tend to be paid more. But when you think about the actual inherent value of the work itself, it is generalized across the whole body of the collective's repertoire. On the other hand, um, an individual songwriter would have virtually no market power when negotiating with a large user or large multinational online music service like a YouTube or an Amazon Music or Apple Music. And similarly, if a creator detects infringement, the costs of enforcement are often much higher than the royalty that would be due for the use of that work. And again, often the pockets of the infringer are much deeper than the pockets of the individual creator. So creators argue, creators position, theoretically from a policy perspective, um, this imbalance of market power means that creators are forced to choose between enforcement costs that exceed potential revenues um, inadequate compensation for the use of their works or no payment at all. So this, this is the tension or one of the tensions that exists. So where does this leave this? And does the tension actually um, equal balance in the system? Some arguments for collectives. Again, we're thinking about layering of rights, number of rights holders multiplied by the number of uses. So arguments for collectives, they can substantially reduce transaction costs and delays for both the rights holder and the user. Collectives arguably monetize uses that are not easily monetized, these microtransactions, uses that are widespread, diverse, um, widespread, diverse copying. This idea of international reciprocity, exchanging, um, exchanging repertoires so that a collective can represent all authors and publishers for uses in Canada or all songwriters and music publishers for uses in Canada, but also that Canadian songwriters and publishers are recognized internationally with those collectives. So you're also getting international revenues by virtue of this international reciprocity. And you can imagine how difficult that would be to do on your own without uh, a body um, collecting those monies for you. Arguments for rights management efficiencies and transparency. I think some would say uh, transparency is not the collective's um, best attribute, but I think they collect the most data out of everyone. They have the best insights into what is copied other than the users themselves. And they 
um, are very good at tracking rights and ownership and uh, flowing through the monies to the right people or organizations. In, in, multiple, can, in yep. multiple countries. In multiple countries, exactly. Which is then shared with, yeah. Right. Yeah. Collectives can reduce or shift liability risks. Some collectives will actually indemnify users. Say, if you copy some, if we say something's in our repertoire, you copy it and you get sued by the rights holder, um, and it's not in our repertoire, we will um, indemnify you for that. So, if you're looking to shift risk, that collectives serve a, a role there. <clears throat> And one-stop shopping. So again, instead of approaching every single rights holder for um, one of these widespread diverse dispersed uses, um, you go to one or three collectives to get the rights you need in order to operate your service. Boing. And collectives can improve a bargaining position of individual creators. I think they generally do. Um, many creators have stronger bargaining position than one in most most cases. Um, I say sometimes because it, it works the other way as well. And easier authorized access for users, usually theoretically and practically. These are the arguments for collectives. There's probably more that you can discuss in, um, in the round table. Arguments against. Uh, copyright board process are long, um, have been long, they're getting better. Um, there's often complaints that services that want to enter Canada can't or decline to because they don't know how much it's going to cost for them to operate in the country. Um, so they uh, so they sit and wait for these copyright board processes to set the rates, which is years and years and years um, before they can understand what their business model actually looks like. Blanket licenses, often people question uh, the repertoire, people, uh, users question whether collectives actually represent the repertoire they say they represent. Um, we looked at the different collectives in the music space and some collectives are now representing the same rights. So CMRA and SOCAN are competing in the space and so that might complicate clearance processes. We haven't seen that yet, but we may. Um, there's often concerns about a lack of innovation or rights management inefficiencies, and also concerns or arguments against because it reduces the bargaining power, position of users, just as it lifts up the bargaining position of creators that necessarily causes the user's bargaining position to go down. And I say sometimes because and often, often we are talking about pretty big institutional users or big, huge multinational corporations. So I tend to, you can tell where my bias sits, but I tend to uh, think that the balancing out, um, allowing individual creators to band together as a collective balances out some of the bargaining power of, of big users. And I mean, it may, they may provide more restrictive and arguably more expensive access for uses sometimes. Um, complaints or concerns that collectives act in anti-competitive ways. Um, I touched on the flip side of this before. And again, the competition amongst the collectives. Territoriality is, uh, it's interesting when you think about uh, uses online because collectives can only represent, sorry, it can only license uses for um, in the territory that they operate. So, so can only licenses uses, public performance or communication uses that occur in Canada. You need to go to the equivalent in France if your work, if your use triggers uses in France as well, even if it's part of the same chain. So if you're delivering something of the internet over the internet, um, you need to consider the place of origin as well as the place of, of receipt. And there's often um, arguments or concerns about onerous reporting obligations or invasion of privacy and things like that. 
to which I say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what's killing collectives? I don't know if it's act they're actually being killed, but here's what's happening. Um, or some of the things that are happening are assertive, assertive collectives or copyright owners. Some concerns that collectives are getting or got too assertive in um, in expressing their rights or asking for high royalty rates or refusing to grant licenses or negotiate. Again, that's that kind of um, monopoly muscle power argument. Um, users have gotten, I think, bolder over the years, and that's partly due to in Canada anyway, this notion of users' rights, what used to be defenses to copyright infringement are now users' rights. And uh, people are, uh, users are expressing those rights as they are entitled to do. There's um, power imbalances. So I think with the increased power, negotiating power of a uh, Google or YouTube or um, you name it, a broadcaster, um, I think it's it's perhaps shifting a little bit so that users have more power. These are always all, obviously all connected. Um, legacy businesses. So collectives are beholden to their membership. And if the membership has a strong legacy business, let's go with print newspapers as an example. Made a lot of money for a long time or made some money for a long time and are hanging on to those legacy businesses, um, they will not allow a collective to innovate beyond where they are with their own businesses. Does that make sense? So that's, that's one of, it doesn't make sense. <clears throat> so all collectives represent a membership, right? Their affiliate base, which are the rights holders themselves. And if the rights holders are um, their prime business is, I can't give a good example. <laughs> if the rights holders aren't innovating themselves and they are wed to their existing business, the collective is not going to advance or innovate beyond where those businesses are. Okay. So Here if the, I, I can give you a very right. simple, simple example. So access copyright, when I worked there, this is not confidential or privileged. Um, we were still licensing paper photocopying only. And it was in part because the publishers and authors in part um, weren't ready to move their own businesses to digital. They didn't know what the digital space looked like. So when they migrated their content online, they needed the collective to step back and just keep doing what it was doing so they could see what the penetration was like in their own digital space. So access to shift into licensing digital was not happening for a long time, well beyond when they had moved, when the, the members, the publishers had moved into that space already. So collectives kind of naturally fill in gaps where the, the market, the business um, can't, can't fill in those gaps themselves. So while access was dawdling, how did you license the digital? <laughs> They weren't dawdling. Thank you very much. We didn't have the the mandate to license in the digital space. Okay, Continue to were, license print. Right. Well, but, but while they were doing that, how did the licensing activity of the of um, the publishers, etc., take place in the digital space? How did the the did you have to so, go to each publisher at a time? Mm -hmm to get digital permission. Yep. Right. Yep. yep. Or infringe or use fair dealing or whatever it happened to be. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go on the Globe and Mail, they were selling individual articles um, through the internet, right? And so rather than access licensing those uses on a collective basis, um, didn't get the rights to do it. Uh, instead, the Globe, I don't even know if this is accurate. I'm sort of hypothetically saying the globe, but um, the globe needed to figure out whether it had a business on its own selling those articles online. Again, these are all linked 
heavy pressure, heavy lobbying campaigns, PR campaigns um, from the copy left public interest campaigns. Um, again, users rights, no, no complaints about this, just the reality. I think the fact that we're talking about intangible assets, people tend to think there's little value in them. So that's always a challenge is establishing um, that there is value and that you should pay for a license to use these things when you find them online. Um, new uses, new technology and slow legislation or an unwillingness of government to um, beef up or move forward to kind of innovate in the collective admin space. And then I said, what's trying to kill them? <laughs> um, rights holders licensing directly, same thing I was just sort of saying, um, or suing. Um, rights, I don't think this is where I didn't put blockchain, but in one iteration I had it. Rights manage, management administration, new tech, maybe there's other competitors out there. Um, and some innovation, YouTube content ID is a good example. Google Books is another example, though if you dig into either of those systems, either of those business businesses, their collective administration of copyright. They just are doing it from the user side, not the rights holder side. So Google Books is actually structured on the same, um, it's the same structure as an access copyright or copy back. The difference was Google just went and did it, waited for the rights holders to sue, and then negotiated royalty rates, distribution policies, uses, all of those things. So bold users developing their own collective administration sort of systems or rights management systems, willing to get sued and then negotiating a solution, I think is also trying to kill <laughs> collectives as we know them. There, questions on that piece. Um, thank you again. Uh, this was so much information. Uh, this was the one that might be a little, not that the first one wasn't intriguing and exciting, but it was the weeds, quite literally. And and now we, we this one was the one where we start to get into some of the issues that are dragging us down, but also um, really interesting to think about. <laughs> um, if you have questions, please pop them in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to bring up my YouTube question now. <laughs> uh, but it also ties to the, what you were talking about with Google and um, uh, I would say Amazon as well and a, a bunch of the other, you know, major corporations. Is it this situation, do you think, well, I don't know how you want to think about answering or if you just want to kind of comment or if you want to not because you can't um uh what you think is happening with uh these major corporations and their push to are they are they creating their own systems because we can't keep up with them or because they're corporations or and and like, is this where we're going? So for those who don't understand where I'm going with this conversation, I did put a link for those who want to watch the video. But essentially, when you um, copyright on YouTube is controlled by YouTube. So they can't follow or they say they can't follow any individual nation's laws because they they deal with everybody. So what they've decided to do is they have their own rules and their rules over supersede any individual nation's rules um and uh if you want to if you want to create on youtube then you have to follow their rules and it's a, it's similar to what's going what you mentioned with google books in that basically google does what they want to do and then you sue them and then they negotiate with you um only youtube has created their own set of copyright law so yeah i don't know comments <laughs> It's ballsy. That's what I'll say. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> is it is yeah, I think you know what it's a I think it's a good question maybe for the um the breakout the table rooms stuff. too. But um I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't like it because I, I, I don't like 
that creators are being forced to well, essentially being forced to sue, right? Mm-hmm. So, so the big multinationals, um, whatever we want to call them, the global tech behemoths um, <laughs> are creating their own rules and doing what they want. And presumably those rules kind of look like copyright rules. Like I'm sure they're not like mm-hmm. a complete, there's no copyright. Um, but they're taking the power away from creators. And this is supposed to be, in my view, it is all supposed to be about ensuring that creators are incentivized to create. And the other things, the dissemination and the easy access and, yeah. and right, the just reward, all of that. Um, but I I kind of hate that the the big users are um, deciding what creators will get. And it's a take it or leave it thing. It's exactly why, one of the reasons anyway, why collectives exist is so that individual creators don't have to go and police all of this and sue them. Imagine, imagine you're an individual songwriter and you find your stuff on um, on YouTube and this is the response you yeah. get. You have to do individual strikes, uh, mm-hmm. and um, and yeah. if the creator, if the, if the channel is bigger than you, then it's going to be that much harder to do. Uh, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, and you're and that is the question. So I'm going to move us. We're going to slide us into the next section a little bit, um, <laughs> but uh, only because that's where the conversation went, and I don't see any questions. Um, is I think that comes back to, as you said, what is copyright? What is what, like, why does it exist? And uh, if from the corporation's perspective, it exists to make money (laughs) as does everything or to control, (laughs) um, then yeah, of course they're gonna take that stand, but I'm I'm gonna pass it over to you for this part here. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we moving into the long may they rain question mark. Um, this is this is us rolling into the breakout rooms. But back to my first or second slide, the entire purpose of of copyright and collectives is this virtuous cycle. So creation, dissemination, access, compensation, or reward. Compensation doesn't have to be cash, but frankly, it helps sometimes. So we want to incentivize creation and dissemination. We want to ensure that the public has access to copyright protected works and lawful legal access to these works. We want to ensure that recognition, reward, compensation flows back to the original creators so they can create the next, the next great thing. And it feeds itself. It should just go round and around and around. And uh, collectives are designed and were designed, and there's a huge system around the world to make sure this happens. They help with not the creation part, but they certainly help with the legal access, the compensation, and flowing that compensation back to the creators. So questions I asked off the top to think about, does the system work or still work? Does it work at all? Has it ever worked? I think it has, but over to you. Uh, Is it fulfilling this purpose? Are there places where it's not? Um, Or are they good? Is it actually an efficient system? Because we're trying to create an efficient system for the exchange of copyright protected works. Is it necessary? Do we still need collectives? Or does blockchain, I I rolled my eyes, sorry, sorry. (laughs) But blockchain is is a, a technology that might assist, but is it actually going to solve the problem instead of collectives? Who owns the blockchain? Question, question, question mark. You're going to have a whole session on blockchain. Uh, as and I understand also, it, right? blockchain saying does blockchain is the same as saying like does the internet? Yeah, you know, in this in this case, and we we will address that a little bit. So, um, are collectives necessary? Is the collective administration of copyright necessary? If it is, what should be changed, if anything, and what would a new system look like? Those are the um, those are the questions that I thought would frame your discussions. But feel free to take it away, Jessica. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and also, I just want to um, come back to this that wh- where you started with this idea. I, one of the things that I think we forget about with copyright is that it is actually there. I mean, it's there for protection, blah blah blah. But it's also it, it is there for creativity, like mm-hmm. it, at, from a creator's perspective, like if you're looking at it from the creator's perspective, it's not 
fair to stifle creativity, although we could have that discussion too. Does mm -hmm. it stifle creativity? Um, that's absolutely a conversation that comes up all the time. But it, the intention is to encourage creativity. And the reason I'm bringing this part up is because I think this is something that um, we tend not to think about when we think about copyright and have these conversations about copyright. We talk about all the other stuff, the rights management, we talk about um, money, we talk about you know control, we talk about uh, dissemination, access, all of that fun stuff. But I think the creativity part kind of often gets lost. So just as a reminder that does, it, it is part of copyright. It's there to allow for creativity to to stop, you know, so you don't have to kind of, there's all kinds of ways we could discuss this and I'm not going to go into it now because uh, this well, is not one of my copyright classes. <laughs> as an extension to that thought though, um, I think we have to keep in mind that if I'm a creator, what I really want to do is my job, create whatever the skill or art or that I do. So I don't really want to spend a lot of my personal time either evaluating what I do or chasing people to pay for it or negotiate. So I need some kind of agency. Uh, now the agency, you could have a collective of three people hire somebody to chase all this stuff for them, but you do need some kind of agency for true creators because they just want to focus on what they do. And I think the question is, is this the right kind of agency? Um, and I do have a question, though, for Aaron. Why are there so many of them? <laughs> uh, oh, like I, I, I'm been through your slide deck a bunch of times and, you know, actor rack and blah, blah, blah. I, I, I just glaze over. Why, why can't, why don't they combine like all other businesses do? and get a scale why are there so many and why are they um i guess if they're non-profit they can't be foreign owned but yeah some yeah. some are foreign owned yeah what some are, what? some are actually foreign owned oh. um and that's that's shifting doug um i think there's so many because the rights holders are different in a lot of cases like very different business interests in some cases, like a label and a publisher, even though they've got the same, it's not even a parent company anymore, Warner Publishing and Warner, the record label, are very different companies. And I think I just I think the interests are quite different. A performer has a very different interest than um, than a music publisher. They're aligned in lots of cases, don't get me wrong, but they just I, I think that's part of it. I think it's historical. Um, I don't know. I don't know beyond that. And they're, these are complex. Like I think about the tariffs I've worked on when it's a sliver of all of the rights and all the rights holders. It's incredibly complex to deal with that sliver. So if you started layering on, it gets pretty, pretty cumbersome. So I don't know. It's my best I mean, answer. I'm glad to hear you say those words, actually. I don't know. There's lots yeah, of things I, I don't know. I've never know. heard you say that. Before. Oh, I say it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are a lot of things that require. We're um, friends. Even if we're, we're just, still friends. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> even if we're just looking within music, there are a lot of things that require um, uh, yeah. rights management. You know, uh, can you unmute yourself? Do you have a question? I did, but I didn't mean to to disrupt this. This That's okay. Year. I'm gonna. <laughs> if there's an, a question, we'll go with it, and then I'm gonna um, end this section and move on. So, yeah, I have a I have a question for Aaron that goes back to the the in the in the, in the weeds section, just sort of a lingering question that was promote sparked by your your more detailed conversation around music, but actually applies to all to books and all other media forms as well. And that is, uh, is there anything maybe not necessarily in the law, but in the application of law? that um, is indicative of how copyrights are managed from the transition from physical media to non-physical media. By that, I mean, you know, from albums, CDs and cassettes to digital content distribution or a move into where you're watching video streaming where there's not a, a, kind of, a kind of tangible product, a physical object that you have to buy, purchase or distribute or transact. 
maybe that's only around the issue of enforcement, but I'm wondering if there are other kind of logistical differences in thinking about copyright around the kind of defysicalization of media in recent years. I like that defysicalization. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tongue word. twister. We both yeah. said it. Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, the rights are essentially the same. It's like the rights don't really change from physical to um, digital, let's call it. Um, the de-physicalization, um, the, the ability to copy certainly changes. Um, it's much easier to get your hands on a first copy or an original um, in the digital space. You can find anything online these days. So access to the, it's called the first copy is much easier. And then the ability to copy that copy and distribute it more widely is certainly much easier than a physical CD or a physical book. And I think the attitude changed dramatically as well, partly because of that ease of copying and ease of dissemination and transmission. So I, I don't know if this is true. It's sort of my, um, my own views on it, but I do think once we moved away from a physical, tangible thing, even though copyright protects the intangible in that physical thing. When we moved away from having a physical thing at all, the value decreased, our, our perceived value of the intangible decreased because there was no physical thing attached to it. Because we could access it much quicker, the perceived value of it um, decreased as well. And I think also in fairness, because we could access things and can access things more easily and copy them more easily, there's a feeling, and it may be right, that because these things are easier to disseminate, we should disseminate them more widely. This is a good thing that the world has access to the world of everything. Conceptually, that's a good thing. So copyright is putting constraints on that, that um, we're always there but it feels more constrained now as we've shifted from physical to digital. And actually, within the publishing industry, for example, yeah. that actually was a yeah. really big issue that suddenly we would purchase books that were locked uh, with digital mm -hmm. rights management. And, um, and so you couldn't, for example, uh, loan your friend yeah. a copy of your book. Uh, and that that completely changed our relationship with books. Uh, and that was a huge issue in yeah. the publishing industry for a really long time. Indies in particular, indie authors in particular, had a really hard, uh, difficult relationship with this. And, and many of them were very much on the side of making sure their books were DRM free. Um, and many were on the side of, yes, but now people are stealing my work because, and so I'm not making any money on each of those individual, not shares, but downloads. Um, and so it's one thing to share because then people see your name and maybe they'll buy your next book, like a loss leader of like any other <laughs> loss leader. But um, the, this, that became a very big issue because suddenly everything is locked, even though it's yours, it's mine. I bought it. Mm -hmm. I own it. I should be able to save a copy of it on my hard drive. I should be able to share it with a friend, but should I? <laughs> so you couldn't in physical, you could share with your friend, you could loan it, sure. Yes, but, but you, you couldn't, couldn't save a copy couldn't of it. scan it and yeah. No, I mean, you could, but it you could, was a lot worse. <laughs> legally, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and legally you couldn't. You're all right. of those things. <laughs> but anyway, yes. So I see, I, I use the example of, of um, publishing first because I know it, but yeah. also because we don't want to get into the Napster situation because that was a completely different mm -hmm. um, thing. Okay. So I am going to say uh, with no more questions at this point, thank you so much, Aaron and Doug for joining us uh, and, um, and giving us so much information about copyright collectives and the way copyright is working right now in Canada and um, allowing us the opportunity to move forward and have these the conversations that we're now going to have in the breakout rooms. So, so thank you again.